At the very bottom of the world, separated from all other land masses by the Southern Ocean, lies a great white wilderness of ice. This is Antarctica, a frozen hostile land that is home for neither man nor beast. It is a continent nearly twice the size of the United States and almost totally covered by one giant ice sheet. A sheet so thick that in places it has depressed the very rock foundation of the landmass hundreds of meters below sea level. Locked in this icy tomb is over 90% of all the Earth's ice and snow and most of this planet's fresh water. If the snow and ice of Antarctica were to melt, the level of the oceans of the world would rise by more than 40 meters. Antarctica is the highest continent on Earth, a great mound of ice and snow averaging over 2,000 meters above sea level. This ice is in perpetual motion, snow that accumulates in the high hinterland of Antarctica from a millennium of winter storms moves slowly and inexorably toward the outer margins of the continent. Glaciers, some of the largest on Earth, are born at the edge of the polar plateau and move as slow-flowing rivers of ice propelled down slope to the sea. Currents and winds of the Southern Ocean constantly gnaw at Antarctica's icy skirt. And icebergs of a thousand shapes and sizes are carved off and begin their one-way voyage to warmer latitudes. Most of the rock to be seen in this otherwise white wilderness is exposed as the tops of lofty peaks which manage to penetrate the icy mantle. This occurs at scattered localities where the ice cover thins, but by far the greatest concentration of mountain peaks is in the great cordillera of the Transantarctic Mountains. This is a collection of hundreds of majestic peaks stretching in a chain along the edge of the Ross Sea and striking to within 300 kilometers of the pole itself.
Antarctica hasn't always been an icy wilderness. Eons ago, it hosted plants and animals of a thousand kinds. During these earlier times, Antarctica was the central portion of a southern supercontinent known as Gondwana. This landmass had existed for millions of years, during which time the climate had varied from arid and desert-like to humid and tropical. Plants and animals evolved and freely migrated over the entire surface of the continent. But about 160 million years ago, as a result of changes deep within the Earth's crust, this supercontinent began to rift. The drifting of South America and Africa gave birth to the Atlantic Ocean. Later, India broke away and eventually collided with Asia. Antarctica and Australia remained united until 60 million years ago when Australia separated, leaving Antarctica lying close to the South Pole. This rift with Australia meant that Antarctica was now completely surrounded by the chilling waters of the circumpolar Southern Ocean. As Antarctica centered over the pole, she began to grow an icy cloak, small and patchy at first, but ever increasing in size and thickness. As the winters worsened and the hours of summer sun shortened, the ice sheet grew layer upon layer. Plants and animals adapted at first, then simply died off and were bulldozed over the edge of the continent by the incessant growth of a vast ice sheet. Five million years ago, the icy mantle reached its present size, and the continent has remained unchanged ever since, a lifeless region where even the dead are preserved for eternity. Only ancient fossils survive to tell us that before the ice, trees and plants flourished. Even fish once swam the rivers and lakes of Antarctica and are now preserved as stony bone. Small creatures that burrowed their homes into muddy or sandy river banks have their tracks preserved forever. Where waves once lapped the shore, we now have a ripple in stone. Even the searing heat of the summer sun that baked the land over 300 million years ago is now preserved as mud cracks in rock. The South Pole today no longer holds the same mystical lure. It is marked by a surveyor's peg, which is relocated as the great ice sheet slides across the continent. Where Scott and Amundsen once plodded their weary paths, tractors and giant aircraft now grace the scene. The United States even has a base at the Pole, and from this unique spot on Earth, scientists are able to record data which will tell us more about the Earth on which we live. There are now over 30 bases scattered around Antarctica and more than 20 countries participating in Antarctic research. Antarctica has been called the largest laboratory on Earth for each year it hosts hundreds of scientists. By virtue of a special treaty signed in 1961, Antarctica is now an international territory with no recognized land claims or political boundaries. There are no border fences no visas, no passports, and no customs offices. One of the largest bases in Antarctica is the United States base of McMurdo Station on Ross Island. This base is like a small town with cinemas, bars, a radio and TV station, and a church. It is from here that the United States directs its activities on the continent. 
the base is strategically close to open sea in summer so that ships can resupply with ease. Snow and ice runways are maintained on the nearby ice shelf for aircraft carrying out internal logistic support or bringing personnel and supplies from New Zealand, only seven hours away. Scott Base is the New Zealand home in Antarctica and is sighted only two kilometres away from McMurdo Station. Small and spartan by comparison with the American base, it is nevertheless a welcome summer home for between 30 and 40 people, 12 of whom spend an entire year at the base. It is a collection of box-like huts, each joined by an iron covered way and wired down to withstand the extremely high winds that characterize the region. Aside from housing the usual living amenities, the base also contains a post office, a communication center, and scientific laboratories used to study the physics of the Earth and atmosphere. A lot of the scientific activity in Antarctica is done from a cold, cramped polar tent pitched on ice in some remote region of the hinterland. This work is carried out during the austral summer when Antarctica is at its warmest and when the sun never sets. For nearly four months each year, the sun simply moves around the sky without ever dipping below the horizon. Living and working in these remote regions requires good shelter, good clothing and good food. Shelter usually consists of a two-man polar tent which is of a design that has not changed since Scott's time. It is pyramidal in shape so as to minimize wind resistance and is supported by four metal poles. Inside the outer windproof walls is a cotton tent that can breathe and yet is capable of storing heat generated from within. In times of emergency, it may become necessary to build an ice cave in the snow. Although the temperature inside these ice boxes does not get much above freezing point, the cave can provide a shelter from the biting wind. Igloos are an alternative to ice caves, 
but considerable skill and time is required for their construction. Antarctic clothing is specially designed to insulate the body and so store body heat. It must above all keep out the chilling Antarctic winds. Access to the remote regions of Antarctica is provided by aircraft. C-130 Hercules have been specially equipped with skis to enable them to land on completely unprepared snow and ice surfaces. Each year these cargo ships of the sky fly vast distances, ferrying men and equipment around and across the ice cap. Helicopters are widely employed for logistic support and although they have a somewhat limited transport range, they have the great advantage that they can land anywhere. They are the pack horses of Antarctic transport. Field transport is usually by means of single-tracked snowmobiles or motor toboggans. These vehicles are able to pull sledges laden with food and equipment. Small journeys are sometimes undertaken by the old method of sledge man-hauling, where provisions and equipment are pulled by men in harness. Huskies were once widely employed in Antarctic travel, but have now been superseded by machines. Even the rising cost of oil is unlikely to postpone the complete obsolescence of these fine four-legged companions on the ice. Ross Island, the starting point for many of the epic journeys of discovery, is quite unique to Antarctica. It hosts the largest active volcano on the continent. 
In fact, the entire island is built up of layer upon layer of volcanic lava and ice. Lava was extruded from three main volcanic centers, Mount Bird, Mount Tira, and Mount Erebus. It is only Mount Erebus which is presently active. It forms the dominant central cone of the island and stands 3,300 meters above sea level. The main crater of Mount Erebus is over 800 meters in diameter and it hosts a smaller inner crater with a permanent lake of molten lava, one of the few such features on Earth. Periodically, the lake erupts as pockets of gas are released from deep within the throat of the volcano. These eruptions emit showers of ash and bombs of molten rock. Captain James Clark Ross, who discovered and named Mount Erebus in 1841, noted at the time that the volcano was emitting black smoke intermingled with flashes of red flame. Within a few minutes' walk from Scott Base on Ross Island is another of the many wonders of the Antarctic. Deep within an ice cornice, entered through a narrow opening, are a number of spectacular caves and caverns of ice. Although the mainland of Antarctica is a biotic desert, the waters of the Southern Ocean, which lap the icy shores of the continent, are the richest pastures of organic life to be found in any oceanic area on Earth. This unparalleled lushness of the Antarctic Ocean is brought about by a unique set of oceanic currents which mix the waters of the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. As cold bottom waters run outward from the continental shelf of Antarctica, Surface waters, rich in life-sustaining nutrients, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and oxygen, move in from the north. These elements are the vital ingredients in the marine food chain, and are taken up by the formation of microscopic single-celled plant life, termed diatoms. Diatoms bloom in profusion in the Antarctic Ocean during summer, nurtured by 24 hours of sunlight and a rich nutrient supply. Small, red, shrimp-like krill feed upon diatoms and are so abundant in summer that the very ocean turns red with their appearance. These krill are the basic diet of a host of Antarctic marine creatures. Higher in the food chain, the predator becomes the prey. Penguins, seals and larger fish feed on smaller fish and squid. In turn, the leopard seal feeds on penguins but may fall prey to the killer whale. Penguins have been labelled the keepers of Antarctica and have a certain synonymity with the continent. They stand on ice shelf and ice island, glacier and rocky headland as dinner-suited guardians of the white wilderness. The daily penguins are summer visitors to the icy shores returning each year to their birthplace in vast rookeries of thousands of birds. The male adelies immediately set about building or renovating their nests of stone. Each stone is a prized possession, for there are no spares after generations of nest building. Eggs are laid in mid-November and are incubated by the male. A short Antarctic summer necessitates rapid development of the chicks. 
By February, they are taught the art of swimming, a skill at which they will become great masters. With the arrival of winter, these new Adelis, with their parents and relatives, begin a northward migration to open waters of the pack ice, leaving behind a frozen world of winter darkness. It is this Antarctic winter, the harshest of all environments on Earth, that the emperors have chosen as their own. They have taken advantage of the natural protection afforded by perpetual darkness and the low temperatures by breeding during the southern winter when all other life has gone north. Here they are free from the raptorial ravages of the skewer gull and the crushing clutches of the leopard seal. The flying birds of Antarctica, of which there are some 30 species, all depend on the sea for food. The skewer, a relative of the common gulls, inhabits the coastal fringe of the continent, but is wide-ranging in his travels. Skewers have been seen at base stations far inland, and even at the pole itself. They breed in rocky nests that are usually sighted near to penguin rookeries, for skewers are predators and prey on penguin eggs and chicks. Antarctic seals are genetically remote from all other seals. They cannot gallop on all fours when ashore, as do other species of seal, and in addition they all mate whilst at sea. It is the Weddell seal that is the most polar seal of all, spending the entire year in Antarctic waters, feeding on fish and squid that in winter must be captured in complete darkness. Weddell seals have a set of teeth which can operate as an extremely efficient saw for cutting through thick ice. These teeth are a vital tool because seals must constantly maintain breathing holes in the ice. Weddell seals carry their unborn pups to a late stage of development, but weaning and independence comes much earlier than for most other mammals. The young must be ready to swim when only three weeks old. The mighty master of the Southern Ocean is the killer whale, and it is he who tops the food chain of the Antarctic Oceanic community. As a member of the dolphin family of mammals, these creatures have a remarkably high intelligence rating and a highly sophisticated communication and navigation system. They live and hunt in packs of up to 20 whales and can move through the water with incredible speed and stealth. Although there are no known reports of killer whales having attacked man, Ponting, who was Scott's photographer on the Terra Nova expedition, was pursued across a shattered ice floe by a snapping set of enamels. The Ross Sea region of Antarctica hosts one of the strangest of Antarctica's many mysteries, the so-called banana belt of the dry valleys. This is a large area of some 4,000 square kilometers that is entirely free of permanent ice and snow cover, despite being well within the clutches of Antarctica's great white cloak. The area is made up of four large valleys that slice through the transantarctic mountains and run to the sea. From their shape and arrangement, it is clear that at one time these valleys were occupied by giant outlet glaciers feeding from the polar plateau. These icy rivers gouged their way down to the coast, carving out U-shaped valleys and leaving spectacular mountain divides. But today there are only remnants of these former mighty glaciers, the merest hint of what was. Fingers of ice hang over the featureless valley walls, but do not advance or retreat. Many don't even form a meltwater stream. They simply evaporate in this cold desert, where the humidity is as low as in the burning deserts of North Africa.
But what caused these glaciers to recede? When did it happen? Is it still going on? Is this a sign that the Antarctic ice sheet is shrinking? These are some of the fundamental questions which still mystify the experts. It is known that the dry valleys have been dry for many tens of thousands of years, and that at one time, immediately following the recession of the main through glaciers, the valleys were actually flooded by the sea and became fjords. But the removal of the glacial ice facilitated a slow and steady uplift of the land surface in the area. This eventually led to a complete withdrawal of the sea from these valleys. But what was it that initiated removal of the glacial ice from these dry valleys? Some suggest it may have resulted from a damming of ice by high and resistant mountains at the valley heads. Others say that a unique set of localised climatic conditions brought about the removal of ice. One thing we can be sure of is that the area is not warmed by some near-surface subterranean volcanism because the rocky substrate is no hotter than normal. The dry valleys are lifeless tracts of sand and rocky rubble. Rocks are sculpted into intricate forms and patterns by a thousand windstorms that have abraded this lunar-like terrain. Everywhere the ground is permanently frozen to great depths and with seasonal temperature changes it expands and contracts to produce a network of polygonal hummocks. Summer temperatures in these valleys are somewhat higher than for the adjacent snow-covered regions of the continent, but the reverse is true during winter. In summer, temperatures may rise above melting point due largely to the ability of the dark-coloured rocks to absorb heat from the long hours of summer sun. Suddenly streams begin to flow. Small lakes lose their icy cover, and the few primitive lichen and algae that have survived the long and cold winter's night continue their slow growth. The dry valleys form the largest snow and ice-free region on the continent. In this area, Antarctica has peeled back a small portion of her icy cloak and has exposed a number of her innermost secrets. The area is a window to the geology and ancient history of the continent. The valleys have attracted scientists from many nations to study under a host of disciplines. These scientists have combined their knowledge and efforts for a greater understanding of a strange environment. International investigation and cooperation prevails throughout Antarctica and is a model for all countries and governments. Just how long this international spirit can survive is questionable bearing in mind the potential mineral wealth of Antarctica, her vast marine resources and of course man's ever-present nationalistic drive. Nevertheless it is something that we should strive to preserve and hopefully by example this attitude will spread to other continents and countries.